Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to the 2022 Inequality Lecture hosted by the Southern Center for Inequality Studies here in Johannesburg. My name is Beginkos Moyo. I'm the director of the Center on African Philanthropy and Social Investment. I'm also a board member at the Southern Center for Inequality Studies. I want to start by uh, advancing apologies from the director of the center who is traveling, Professor Imran Valodia. I'm stepping in and I'm so excited uh, to host this lecture together with my colleagues at the center and the entire university. The center, uh, the, the Southern Center for Inequality Studies is a multi-partner research and policy project that focuses on understanding and addressing issues of inequality in the global South and building a collaborative Southern institution to strengthen and sustain this work. There's a starting premise, which is that while technical solutions to addressing inequality are very important, these on their own will not be politically feasible unless the social and political forces driving high levels of inequality are clearly understood and addressed. Inequality, as you will all agree, is a global problem and starting and addressing it in South Africa enables us to enter into a dialogue about inequality in other settings across the global South. Uh, the purpose of this inequality lecture is to invite, as always, a renowned expert in the field of inequality studies to showcase the latest research and thinking on inequality studies, as well as the practice around the world. We are very um, lucky this year to be joined by a scholar, but also somebody who has worked in several institutions addressing similar issues. So this is my singular honor now to invite uh, our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Research, Professor Lynn Morris, to make a few remarks, but also introduce our guest speaker. Professor, offer to you. Thanks very much, Becca, Be uh, Becky or Prof Moyo. Um, and welcome everybody um, from all around the world to, uh, to this very prestigious letter, uh, uh, lecture. Um, and Vitz is very proud to be hosting this, uh, this event. And we're particularly delighted that Dr. Shahara Razavi has agreed to deliver this very topical and relevant lecture. And it's very fitting given that South Africa is consistently ranked as one of the most unequal countries in the world. And this is a, an empirical fact that has its roots in the history of colonization and apartheid. And it's widely recognized that high levels of inequality are detrimental to society and its econo economy as inequality co correlates with various social problems such as health, mortality rates and crime. Essentially high levels of inequality indicate that a large segment of our society is excluded from economic opportunity, limiting individual outcomes and at the aggregate, the performance of the, eco of the economy. And inequality in South Africa has long been recognized as one of the most salient features of our society and, and, and by universities such as WITS and hence the, you know, why we have research institutes that are dedicated to studying this. And of course, the COVID pandemic illuminated this further, the economic and social inequalities and underscored the urgent need to implement social protection instruments to protect the most vulnerable. And indeed, in 2020, the South African government introduced the social relief of distress, the SRD grant, to lessen the economic effects of the pandemic. And a number of groups are now appealing um, you know, to the government to transform this grant into a monthly basic income uh, for, for, uh, for, for, for individuals, recognizing that this is a, a chronic and systemic problem and not just a transitory one. Um, so in her keynote address, um, Dr. Rezavia will look at the connection between inequality and social protection and explore both the potential and limits of social protection policies in reducing inequalities, the kinds of social protection policies that have been most effective in reducing inequalities and the importance of building these universal um, systems. Um, and so it really gives me great pleasure to, uh, to, to read her bio and to introduce her. She is the director of the Social Protection Department at the International Labour Organization um, since February 2020, so the ILO, based in, in Geneva. Um, but prior to joining the ILO, she was the chief of the research and data section at the UN, um, at UN Women uh, between 2013 and 2020, where she directed the research for the entity's major flagship reports. 
She oversaw gender statistics program uh, and provided technical support to intergovernmental negotiations. She was a senior researcher at the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development, um, UNRISD, where she coordinated cross-country comparative research programs, the interface of social policy, social protection, labor markets, and the care economy. She obtained her BSc from the London School of Economics and Political Science, the LSE, and her MSc and DPhil, uh, or PhD, from Oxford University. And she's published extensively on social policy, social protection, gender, and work in a development context. And uh, the reason why she's giving this talk is because she is a, 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 a long-term collaborator of Prof Imran Velodia, who, as you know, is the director of this institute. So it's really um, just wonderful that, that she is um, sustaining this collaboration. And also just to highlight, you know, that, uh, that in addition to this being a, a, a flagship topic and a, a, a advocates, is that uh, Prof Velodia has also recently, many of you will know, um, been made the pro um, vice chancellor here at WITS to focus on inequality amongst other things, uh, also climate change, and really just speaking to the importance that the university gives to these very important topics. So with that, I'm going to hand over to our guest speaker and uh, I hope you all enjoy the lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Morris, and, and thanks very much to Professor Moyo as well. I'm really delighted to be here with you for this lecture. It's a, it's a great honor for me uh, to be giving this lecture at the Southern Center for Inequality Studies. Um, I'm sorry that uh, Professor uh, Imran Valodia could not be with us today, but uh, I'm sure he's thinking of us and, and, uh, and hopefully uh, we will have a chat when he's back. So, so let me proceed with uh, um, the, the lecture. I'm uh, going to uh, move to the slide to show the outline of uh, the lecture first. And as you can see, uh, we, I'm going to be focusing on inequalities, uh, providing some basic definitions and saying a few words about trends and uh, why this theme has such a growing policy resonance uh, today. Uh, and then move on in, in the second part to talk about social protections role as, uh, as Lynn was just saying, uh, and its effectiveness in reducing both poverty and inequality, uh, inequalities, I should say in the plural. Uh, and then I will be looking a bit more at, um, in detail at how we can build universal social protection systems uh, in, in addressing these multiple uh, and intersecting inequalities that we have and what exactly that entails before bringing the lecture to a close. Um, so let me move to the first slide when say a few words about uh, the, some of the concepts that I'll be using. Uh, obviously um, inequalities, I'll be talking about uh, what is called vertical inequality. This is uh, inequalities between rich and poor households but also focusing on the area of what is called horizontal inequalities, inequalities among different groups in society, which could be differentiated by gender, uh, ethnicity, um, age, uh, or other, other uh, stratifiers. And of course, we know that these inequalities can become particularly entrenched when, where and when they intersect and particular groups, uh, for example, uh, women who may be from certain um, indigenous or tribal uh, communities uh, may face multiple intersecting inequalities, which really entrench the kind of disadvantages that they face, or um, ethnic minorities who are living with HIV AIDS, you know, that in, in itself can also become uh, quite a source of entrenched inequalities. Now, there's also, there's been quite a bit of, uh, you know, long lasting debates in philosophy and uh, economics and political science about equality of what? Equality of opportunities or outcomes. Uh, what I really want to highlight here is, I don't want to get into too much of the philosophical discussions, but just to say that within the policy domain, when uh, after, I would say, a bit of silence about inequality, when the, when the issue re-emerged on the policy agenda, uh, and I would take one of the indications of that uh, emergence in the mainstream policy debates, the World Bank report of 2006 that looked at inequality. The focus was very much on uh, trying to look at um, equality of opportunity rather than really focusing on equality of outcome or income inequality. 
but when we when we really look into the issues, uh, this kind of seems like uh, a rather a false dichotomy, I would say. So if we can now uh, shift to the next uh, figure here, what you really can see is uh, the fact that countries that have lower levels of um, uh, of income inequality captured through the Gini index are also those that have uh, higher levels of mobility, of social mobility, and what we can see as equality of opportunity. And that high levels of inequality, if you move to the right-hand side of this figure, where Brazil and Peru um, uh, are located, you have high levels of inequality, but also a relatively limited intergenerational uh, mobility. And there's a wonderful quotation from, uh, from Tony Atkinson, on the corner there, which I think captures this quite well. If we're concerned about really having equality of opportunity tomorrow, we should be uh, we should be worried about equality of outcome today because of the way in which they um, kind of, in a circular way, uh, recreate each other. Now, if we can just quickly move about why there is this growing interest in inequality, I would say that you know interest in the issue of inequality has been growing. Uh, because despite you know, the long-term trends, I would say, between 1940 and the 1980, when inequality was being reduced, there has actually uh, been an upsurge in inequality over the past 30 years, and this is quite well documented. In OECD countries in particular, uh, the average incomes of the top 10% uh, have reached almost 10 times the bottom 10%, which is uh, a, an increase compared to the ratio uh, of um, of seven to one in the 1980s. So so there has been quite a quite a change. And in the next figure, we will in the next couple of figures, we will see this increase. Also, very importantly, if we if we look at some of the countries that had uh, some of some very high levels of inequality, and I think this point was uh, also highlighted by previous lectures, uh, in Latin America being a region with very high levels of inequality. In this period where the OECD countries have, uh, as a general trend, seen increasing inequalities, there have been countries like Brazil, Bolivia, and Ecuador, where inequality has been uh, reduced in this period. Nevertheless, as we will see in the next figure, Latin America continues to be a region which has some of the highest levels of income inequality in the world, although, as we will see, um, this, is, um, this is their outpaced, I should say, by both Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East and North Africa region. So if we move to the next slide where you can see this level of inequalities that we have with the red bars, this is the top 10%. And as you see in both MENA and Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as Latin America, uh, the share of the top 10% is really above 50% of income, while the bottom 50% uh, in, in MENA, for example, is receiving less than 10% of, of, of income. So uh, pr pretty significant gaps here in, in income inequality by region. And if we can quickly move to the next slide, I think uh, also to say a useful measure of inequality, if we really want to focus on the world of work, is um, looking at the way in which uh, the income is divided between uh, wages and profits, what is sometimes referred to as the functional distribution of income. Now, when we look at a, a functional distribution of income, we see the division, as I said, between labor and capital, the division of income between labor and capital. And a falling labor share often means that there is more rapid growth in labor productivity than in average labor compensation and an increase in returns to capital relative to labor. So this is something that ILO has been documenting in the global wage report uh, uh, in particular here, I'm citing the 2016 Global Wage Report, which uh, showed this change. Uh, and in the next figure, which is taken from the same report, what we will see is that over the period from 1995 to 2014, uh, for a sample of about 133 countries, what we can see is that the figure shows a, a lower uh, uh, percentage of income going to labor compared to capital. Uh, if we can maybe quickly just go to the next figure um, to show you uh, what 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 this uh, figure is showing, what I just mentioned, the change over this period between 1995 and 20, 2014, where there's a clear shift leftward showing a decline in the distribution of estimated labor income 
with the median value about two percentage points lower in 2014. But let me also highlight that extent of inequality is an important, uh, the extent of informality in the labor market is an important source of inequality in developing countries. And conversely, some of the cases of countries that we have where inequality has been reduced over the past couple of decades, uh, a prerequisite for lowering inequality has in these countries in Latin America in particular really been uh, an effort to reduce informality in labor markets, i.e. to formalize enterprises and, uh, and, and employment. And we'll say a little bit more about that later. So if we can now go to the slide on an emerging consensus, uh, what I really want to highlight is that while there may not be a consensus, you know, on the level of inequality that is acceptable, uh, there is an emerging body of work that really is showing uh, what, what Lynn was saying in her introductory remarks, that the levels of inequality that we currently have are excessive. And the impacts are in terms of there's been quite a, a considerable literature on this, and I'm only citing, you know, a few sources here. Uh, the, the really uh, uh, the adverse impacts on mental and physical health, uh, the, the, uh, the fact that with high levels of inequality, it becomes very difficult to reduce poverty um, as GDP rises, and also the really uh, harmful effects in terms of social cohesions and trust, uh, and uh, as well as uh, the contribution that it makes to environmental degradation when you have very high levels of income inequality. Uh, as well as even having uh, uh, negative impacts in terms of the, the growth of the economy. So it's not just the social indicators that are being harmed and social outcomes, but also having rather negative implications uh, economically. And of course, we know that uh, this concentration of wealth and income can also have very adverse political implications um, in terms of capture of power and, and what that does to democracies. But that's not my focus here. But let me just say that during the COVID pandemic, I mean, one thing that came out very clearly was that, you know, we were not, you know, COVID was a virus that affected everyone, regardless of class or gender or, um, you know, race or ethnicity. But it was also a great revealer of how unequal our societies were, as well as amplifying the existing inequalities. And there's a nice quotation that I have here from the Secretary General, UN Secretary General's lecture in his um, Nelson Mandela lecture in 2020, where he said that COVID has really exploded the myth that we're all in the same boat, because while we are all floating on the same sea, it's clear that some are in, are in super yachts while others are clinging to drifting debris. And I think that really captures that COVID moment that these inequalities became so starkly visible and also uh, uh, exacerbated. And so not surprising that the World Bank and IMF have also been, um, I think, paying more attention to the issue of inequality, particularly the way in which it can have adverse implications uh, uh, for economic uh, dynamism and growth. Now, whether we will see policy shifts that really address those inequalities, I think that's a bigger question that I'll have a little bit more to say about later. Now, let me also quickly move to the issue of gender inequality, because there is this idea that uh, while this era of neoliberal um, sort of uh, policy has been uh, adverse for vertical inequalities or inequalities between households, that it has somehow not been such a bad uh, period for gender inequalities. Even uh, I think some arguments about feminism having some kind of affinity with um, sort of some liberal notions or maybe even neoliberal notions um, in, in some of the debates uh, on, on the subject. But what we see is that, well, actually, even though the past decades have been uh, rather positive in, in some, in the long, you know, durée of seeing a reduction in some forms of gender inequality, when we look at economic inequalities, and when we look at, for example, the way in which labor markets continue to be segregated um, uh, by gender, uh, this really, we see that the, the past two, three decades have not been, uh, uh, have not really seen a rising tide. Uh, women tend to continuously congregate in relatively low paid and low status work at the bottom of the occupational hierarchy, whether we're looking at OECD countries or developing countries, this kind of segregation by gender is quite a quite a, a universal feature. 
uh, and where gender intersects with ethnicity, we see these structural disadvantages being exacerbated. And even in OECD countries where if we look at labor force participation rates, there may be a convergence between women's and men's labor force participation. Gender differences really persist in terms of labor market status and earnings. Uh, there is no doubt about that. Uh, and also we have some uh, good estimates from the ILO that show that looking at uh, data from 70 countries and about 80% of the wage employees, women are earning on average, this is an average using different methodologies for the calculation of the gender wage gap, women are earning about 20% less than men. And so in the next figure, you just have a few sort of summary points uh, from these gender inequality dashboards. And I'm watching the time, uh, you can see some of the key outcomes here that particularly between 2019 and 2020, we have seen that women have in particular during the pandemic lost out in terms of employment uh, uh, compared to men. Um, and also that these gender gaps in employment have not been converging and have in fact been diverging. Um, and that also maybe to just point out that uh, 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 one of the important areas that we also sort of highlight in this gender gap is the, the what we call the child care policy gap or the lag between the time when leave entitlements come to an end and the age at which children can go either to a creche or attend primary school on average about four years and we know what that does in terms of women's employment um, chances women's uh, uh, what is sometimes called uh, a motherhood penalty. Now, I, I, I'm conscious of time. I just want to very briefly say that in terms of global inequality, I know previous lectures, the lecture by Ravi Kanpur in particular, looked at some of the issues. Uh, I think the sort of uh, key point here to say is that while inequality has increased within most countries, not all, but most countries over the past four decades, global inequalities between countries uh, ha have somewhat declined. Uh, and this, of course, we know has been partly because of the way in which countries, vast economies like China and India have had uh, uh, income per capita income growth rates, which have been higher than in high income countries. So there has been a certain degree of convergence. Um, and you see this in the next figure where we look at the, the, the blue line here being the between country inequality, where after 1980, we see a decline while in terms of um, within country inequalities, you know, this is the kind of neoliberal er era, if I can use that term as a shorthand, we see an increase. But, but that's not all there is to global inequality. And there's some um, interesting work that if you shows that if you disaggregate global per capita income growth trends between 1980 and 2020 into percent percentiles of the world distribution of income from poorest to richest, we see that it's an actually more complicated story with the bottom 50% of incomes of the world seeing a substantial growth. And you can see this in the next figure, which is the so-called elephant curve, uh, where the bottom 50% of incomes of the world have seen a substantial growth uh, in this period. And the top 20% as well have benefited hugely with very high growth uh, between 100 and 200%, but intermediate categories grew it, growing much less. So, so this is another way of looking at global inequalities. And of course, I just want to emphasize that one of the most powerful reasons for the persistent inequality uh, within countries that we see is the inequality in the ownership of wealth. And the next figure, um, I think, captures this very well, where we see uh, the net personal wealth held by the top 1% uh, of the national wealth distribution. And here you see uh, it's not just South Africa, but Southern Africa having some of the highest, highest rates with uh, the top 1% continuing to hold between 34 to 55% of total national wealth. Big figure, but also uh, interesting in terms of uh, the possibilities um, uh, for having taxes, progressive taxes that can finance social protection. So let me use that as uh, my segue to move to the next part of uh, the lecture. But before doing so, let me just quickly say there has been some discussion within economics, uh, Arthur Okun in particular talking about leaky buckets and this idea that there may be a trade off between uh, growth and equality and that if we want to have high rates of growth, maybe we need to put up with inequality. Uh, but really more recent evidence, uh, also the economic history of countries that have kind of developed the late developmental states, you know, countries uh, in Scandinavian countries, many of the welfare states 
having done so through reducing inequality, really uh, rejecting this, this, this idea of a, of a trade-off. And here you also see um, a, a figure that really shows that there is no such trade-off between growth and inequality. We can have, we can reduce inequalities without harming uh, the prospects of economic dynamism. That's kind of the message that I want to leave with you at this point before moving to the next part, which is really to talk about the role of social protection in reducing poverty and inequalities. There's a clear positive association between higher levels of social protection expenditure and lower poverty rates that you see in this slide. Uh, showing uh, showing the, the, uh, the positive impact of uh, expenditure on social protection in reducing poverty rates. I also want to show you the next figure on uh, poverty rates among single mothers. We know that families with children are in general at a higher risk of poverty due to the costs of raising children and also the difficulty of reconciling caregiving with paid work. Uh, so, and very often single parent households the majority of whom are headed by women, face often the greatest challenges. And here, indeed, we can see that without social transfers, more than half of single mothers and their children would be living in poverty across a wide range of countries, and that social transfers are essential for reducing the poverty rate of single mothers in countries, although their impact, as you can see, varies hugely uh, across, across countries. Let me now move on to the issue of inequality and role of social protection in reducing inequalities. Um, and if we can quickly look at the, at the next figure that shows the role of social protection here, comparing levels of inequality in market incomes as measured by the Gini coefficient, this combines uh, the green and blue bars uh, with the levels of inequality in disposable income. That's the green bar. This is the money that you have after taxes and transfers. And what you can see is that there is a reduction in inequality, in inequality, which is achieved through social protection transfers, the dark blue bars, as well as taxes, which are the light blue bars. But, but these you know, obviously vary hugely from country to country. Uh, while many of the European countries that are clustered to the left of this figure reduce inequality by about one third through the combined effect of taxes and transfers, for many of the middle income countries that are in the middle to the right of this figure, uh, the, the impact of social protection in, in having that effect of trans transfers and taxes and in reducing inequality, income inequality is, um, is, is less powerful. Um, so, so much less of an impact there. Uh, and also, if I can just move to the next figure, which also shows the impact that transfers have in helping women have disposable incomes that are closer to men's disposable incomes. And here we see that in market income, women uh, have a relatively lower share of the income that men have. But once you add the transfers to it in disposable incomes, there is a slight you know, increase, uh, improvement in terms of the, the income that women have in their hands compared to men after transfers are taken into account but obviously insufficient to redress the, 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 the disadvantages that arise from uh, labor markets. Um, and, and therefore you need other kinds of policies that as, a, as I will point to. Now, and let me move now to really the third and, and uh, hopefully the part that has a bit more in terms of policy ideas. Um, so how do we build uh, universal social protection systems that can really uh, help us address these growing levels of inequality as well as you know, being able to reduce and prevent poverty. And I just want to highlight you know, a number of key messages. I'll say a little bit about them. But here in the next slide, you see uh, the key messages about you know, going for universalism if you really don't want to have uh, high levels of exclusion, uh, pursuing a two-dimensional strategy. And I will say a little bit about what that means. Uh, what that means. I know this idea of a universal basic income uh, is, is an idea that has uh, been having a lot of discussion and, and in South Africa, as well as more globally. And, and so I'll say a little bit about that. Uh, and then need to really think about uh, the social protection policies having to work in tandem with other policies. So if we can go to the next slide on the need to go universal if you want to leave no one behind, this is really looking at the facts, uh, uh, comparing uh, the, the effect of um, 
uh, welfare systems in reducing uh, levels of inequality. And what we know is that universal schemes tend to receive more public funding. They tend to offer higher value transfers to their recipients. They enjoy a higher quality implementation. And also they tend to exclude fewer people who are uh, living in poverty. So these kind of risks of ex exclusion are much, much lower compared to um, uh, systems that are not universal. And there is a political economy explanation for that, is that when you have more universalistic approaches, you're better able to mobilize support from the general public uh, across all income levels, a greater willingness to pay taxes because they also see benefits in the welfare system. And so therefore you can have better redistributive budgets in countries where universal approaches prevail. However, I think it's important to say that this does not mean that you don't have means tested or targeted transfers. Uh, all, most uh, uh, universal countries with universal systems do have those. But in countries where universality of social protection is the norm, it's the universal or near universal life cycle benefits that really take up the big lion's share of social security spending. But alongside that, you also have means tested schemes that do play a residual role, role and an important role for people who face, for all kinds of reasons, uh, have uh, multiple exclusions and cannot access some of the other systems. Um, so therefore targeted schemes that are part of universal social protection systems, it's important that they're rights-based, uh, that, that they have very clear eligibility criteria, that benefit levels uh, are clear and adequate, and that there are modalities so that uh, anchored in legislation so that those who have entitlements can actually claim those benefits and can enjoy transfer, you know, uh, accountability, and the state is accountable in terms of um, uh, making those entitlements, uh, realizing those entitlements. So moving on to the next slide, um, you can have very good sort of tax finance, uh, universal social protection floors, uh, which, which are in place uh, guaranteeing access to essential healthcare and basic income security for everyone. But it's really important, and this is something that was uh, very, um, very uh, strongly underlined uh, in the ILO um, recommendation 202 on social protection floors, that we need to pursue a two-dimensional strategy, particularly as countries have increasing middle classes, you know, who will uh, need to secure higher levels of protection uh, through contributory mechanisms that are really based on social solidarity, uh, especially social insurance uh, mechanisms to help individuals maintain their standard of living when they're unemployed or when they face other uh, uh, risks, life cycle risks. And of course, uh, the challenge here is to really extend these social insurance schemes to increasing numbers of people who in, in many developing countries are working in what is now called the informal economy. So the challenge is really how to extend the social protection system and the social insurance system in particular to encompass uh, more, uh, uh, more workers uh, who have been hitherto excluded and are working within the informal economy. And in the next slide, you have, I think, some key issues emerging, uh, emerging from country level experiences about the kind of uh, schemes that can, and the kind of design features that can really help extend uh, coverage uh, of workers uh, who, who may be self-employed or informal wage workers and so forth. Um, you know, to, to really make sure that there is a mandatory coverage, that to increase the risk pools uh, and so forth. Um, and, and also on, on the right hand side, some of the issues that we know are often work uh, uh, in a way that reduces the capacity of social insurance systems to be uh, so uh, uh, extensive and encompass more workers. Now, let me move on to the third slide and my, my final slide in this set, which is about um, how to really pursue universal social protection and, 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 and what that means in terms of uh, whether a, a universal basic income uh, can, 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 can address the same needs. Now, universal social protection uh, requires that everyone is adequately protected throughout their life, you know, from cradle to grave, as it were. And that they know and they have a guaranteed uh, um, uh, uh, entitlement when they need it. 
It doesn't necessarily, however, mean that everyone should get the same and equal benefit on a continuous basis. But, you know, but a UBI can be an optimal social protection policy to achieve income security. You know, this is kind of, uh, and if we pose that as a question, I think the answer really has to be, you know, it depends. It depends on a number of factors. It depends if the benefit level is adequate. Uh, it depends if, uh, at the same time, the uh, governments are also investing in public services, in healthcare, childcare, long-term care services. Also, very importantly, that there is not an erosion of the social insurance mechanisms, and that a thin UBI is not used as an excuse, you know, for dismantling or not investing in uh, in contributory systems. Uh, so, but and there was an issue, and I'm citing here a paper that was published by ILO in 2018 by uh, Isabel Ortiz and colleagues that calculated what a UBI would cost and showed that it, uh, you know, uh, taking uh, average data from uh, most uh, from countries in most regions and showed that between 20 to 35% of GDP would have to be allocated to have a UBI, um, which could really obviously not is not a sustainable proposition. And it really could put at risk, you know, um, uh, a number of other issues that are absolutely key for having uh, a strong universal system with both uh, tax finance and contributory mechanisms. Uh, I know that there are more interesting debates going on in uh, South Africa on the UBI, and I'm happy to have uh, some discussion on that in, uh, as we move uh, to the uh, question and answer session. Now, I think uh, there's an important point that I really want to emphasize here, whether it's in the context of the discussions in South Africa on, uh, on how to extend social protection, uh, to say that we are today at a very critical juncture. You know, just two weeks ago, Eurodad released a report that exposed the dangers of a post-pandemic austerity shock that is really gripping the world, uh, a shock that is far more premature and severe than the one that followed the 2008 financial crisis. The report, the Eurodad report, uh, shows that in 143 countries, including 94 of these countries being developing countries, they're implementing policy measures that undermine the capacity of governments to provide social protection, to provide education, healthcare, and other public services. Now, it doesn't have to be this way. And I think it's really important to emphasize, particularly in the context of the kind of wealth that has been created and the kind of inequalities that have been exacerbated over the past two, three years in particular, there are options. You know, we don't have to go for austerity. Many countries, and particularly, you know, those countries that we saw in the map with very high levels of inequality, wealth inequality, there are options for having things like more progressive income and wealth taxes that can help finance and uh, a social protection system and other public services, and not forcing us to having to make trade-offs, you know, between investing in health or investing in social protection, uh, income security measures. Um, so I think it's really important that we emphasize these options. And here I've taken some of the options from the fiscal handbook uh, that uh, is available on the ILO website, uh, which you can uh, look at. And many different options for creating fiscal space for social protection. And these options are not just for you know, OECD countries, but also for all developing countries. Ultimately, what countries need to do is to end austerity by creating the fiscal space to finance a recovery that is really inclusive. And there are many options for creating this fiscal space. And we need a, a national, and I would say a global financial architecture as well. And I don't have, you know, we don't have time to discuss that, that really serves the real economy and working families, the real people, and facilitates the right to social security, and not one that works at cross purposes with the right to social security and uh, the needs of real people and real families. Now, I have one more slide to go, and I hope that I'm still within time. Um, actually, two more slides. Uh, now, I, I do want to say a few words about other, po other policies that need to work in tandem with social protection, because we cannot you know, have economic policies, employment policies, uh, fiscal policies, um, that are working at cross purposes and expect social protection to do um, to do all the you know to clean up you know all of the all of the uh, damage uh, that other policies are creating. Uh, I mean, I think so. It's important that we have this what we call in the in the UN context. You know, we have um, policy coherence um, 
and that these policies are really working in tandem with each other. First of all, I think it's important to emphasize that social protection is not a disincentive to employment. There's a lot of evidence that shows that. Um, and I think, I believe the Institute for Economic Justice uh, shared with me a paper on jobs versus grants that really, uh, I think, demystified and, and rebuffed uh, some of those uh, claims. Uh, in fact, I would go further and say that social protection is a precondition for having well-functioning labor markets that really provide decent employment without shifting the risks onto uh, individual workers or individual employers. Um, and also we need labor markets that really uh, a social protection system that has different branches uh, that, that over time these different branches are developed that ensure wide risk pooling and also the portability of benefits so that we have you know, more dynamism and real flexibility in the labor market. So people can move from one sector to another, from one region to another, or from one type of employment to another. Social insurance schemes having to be really mandatory cover all work arrangements. And this is a big challenge. We know this. Um, uh, today, social protection systems, social insurance schemes uh, are not necessarily there. But many countries are moving in the right direction by extending the social insurance to different types of work, whether it's part time work, temporary workers, self employed workers and so on. To really achieve wide coverage and, uh, and and to really have those who have the contributory capacity to make the contributions and have the contributory systems uh, that that can also relieve and take some of the pressure off uh, the tax financed uh, social protection. So that's, I think, a very important lesson there. And also that social protection has to work hand in hand with labor protection um, to reduce inequalities. Uh, minimum wages that are fixed at, a, at an adequate level have proven to be very effective to move in this direction. Um, and also uh, labor market formalization, obviously very important formalization of small enterprises. And uh, needless to say, I think investment in care services are absolutely critical, particularly if we are to create a kind of level playing field to really create the much lower levels of market um, income inequality than we saw in the earlier figures, particularly in, in, uh, from a gender perspective. So we need in tandem these investments in, in public services and public care services in particular. So I'm pretty much, I think, hopefully within time. And if I can just leave you with a few final thoughts. Um, uh, the global inequality, I think we know that the current levels of inequality are excessive, uh, unacceptable, morally unacceptable, and also unsustainable, uh, economically, socially, and I would also say politically. Um, gender inequalities are alarming. Uh, the neoliberal kind of era has not been uh, a kind of rising, uh, you know, a rising tide in terms of gender uh, equality. And we have these very stubborn and entrenched gender gaps uh, that have only become exacerbated during the COVID pandemic, with women actually losing out in terms of their access to uh, the labor market and the toehold that they had in the labor market. The growth equality trade-off uh, is empirically unsubstantiated. And I think we can look at social protection systems as investments that are not only good in terms of social development, equality, and uh, uh, and redistribution, but also that can create uh, more inclusive and sustainable economies. Um, of course, the devil is in the detail and the design of that social protection system matters a lot in how it achieves uh, these, uh, these goals. Um, and I think you know, the pandemic has made it very clear uh, the urgency of building universal social uh, protection systems that provide a solid social protection floor but also increasingly the vertical dimension is very important to make sure that increasing numbers of workers, the emerging middle classes can put, uh, can, can save into these social insurance systems that have this element of solidarity rather than being kind of encouraged to go into very privatized individual accounts and saving mechanisms, individualized saving mechanisms that are, uh, that are not good for redistribution and that would risk increasing uh, inequalities. Now, I think also to leave you with the point that all countries have options to create fiscal space, particularly countries where there is uh, um, a lot of income and wage uh, and, and, and wealth inequality. We have, we can explore all, all kinds of uh, taxes, progressive taxes, 
Uh, and I think, you know, IMF uh, is coming out with more research showing uh, the, uh, the reliance, the need to rely on a more diverse set of taxes and not just kind of value added taxes or consumption taxes. Uh, which can raise the resources that we need for investments in social protection and public services, and also at the same time reduce these uh, grotesque levels of inequality that have become so entrenched. And finally, that social protection really cannot be uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the only uh, policy tool, policy response that we have. It needs to really work in tandem with other policies, including employment policies, as well as uh, fiscal policies uh, and investments in public services. So let me leave it here and look forward to uh, the questions and uh, the actions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Razavi, for such a third force of a lecture. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone else, our partners that include Conversation Africa, the entire Vest University and colleagues from uh, many institutions that have joined us are uh, longing to engage you on a question and answer session. Uh, to kick us off, I already see a question here that uh, seems to be focusing on some of the options that you were sharing on financing uh, social protection. And the question here from an anonymous attendee says, in low-income countries, a major challenge to implementing universal social protection or SEMI is the huge resource it requires and this, as you have already outlined in your presentation, there are a wide range of options to finance such schemes. However, I would say that most of the, op most of the options seem to fit the OECD context. So what is your take on the possibility of using already pervasive informal social protection mechanisms in low-income countries? Are there any options of using such widely available self-help initiatives. So that's the first question that I think, um, you know, has just been put there. And then uh, colleagues, if you want to raise a question, you can type in on the chat or question and answer function or raise your hand and I'm going to ask the technical colleagues to unmute you. Uh, so I see Jerome, uh, you want to ask if you can uh, uh, raise your hand and then I think the technical team can give you the mic. Jerome. Hello, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, yes, hi, thanks for the, for the presentation. Um, I, I have two related questions. Um, the one is if you could share some of the, the evidence that you alluded to showing that, you know, social protection and, and kind of labor market functioning go hand in hand. Uh, yeah, some some more concrete, maybe theoretical element or something. And then the other one is uh, about what you said at the end. Now, um, in countries where there's very large inequality, the wealthy are usually extremely powerful as compared to government. Um, so, how do we enforce a type of pro you know, progressive taxation, it's probably the most urgent in these countries, but it's also the most difficult to enforce. So, you know, where, where's the way out of that, of that dilemma? Okay, great. Can I just ask, um, I think it's Neil Coleman, if you want to, to express your observations, I could see you were commenting on some of the nuances and uh, contextual differences in the understanding of uh, the universal income grant. Neil, do you want to come through? Okay, I think we can take those questions for now, Dr. Razavi, and then we'll, we'll, we'll cycle back. Thank you very much uh, for those questions. I mean, I think I, I do want to sort of go on some of the options that were there. I mean, uh, I don't think those options are, uh, I mean, they're not limited to OECD countries. Um, I mean, eliminating illicit financial flows, this is something which is a huge problem, I think, for, um, for developing countries. We know that developing countries are losing a lot of uh, resources through these um, illicit financial flows. In particular, we know from Africa, there is 
quite substantial uh, loss of income, loss of um, resources through uh, the, the illicit financial flows. The idea of having, uh, you know, extending social insurance coverage uh, and having more social and more workers included within social insurance, because that also brings in both the employer and the worker contributions. Again, I, you know, I don't think this is something which is only suitable for OECD countries. Um, social insurance uh, programs uh, have been in place, uh, I would say, in some of the countries in Latin America that have done quite well in terms of reducing inequalities. This has happened at the same time that they had started formalizing the very small and uh, micro enterprises. I mean, countries like Brazil, um, countries uh, like Costa Rica and others that have um, extended social protection have done that through uh, the formalization of small and micro enterprises with, uh, with bringing in some contributory resources into the social insurance system. That has also helped, um, you know, extend uh, the reach uh, of those uh, entitlements and benefits. Um, so I think, you know, the experience uh, over the past couple of decades in Latin America is quite useful in terms of ways in which the social protection system can be used and uh, and the changes, particularly with formalization of uh, of small and, uh, and and even micro enterprises, can be very helpful both in extending coverage of the social protection system and in bringing more resources into, um, into, into social protection. So I think those are useful uh, examples. Also, um, I mean, I think if you, uh, as you saw in, in the figures, I mean, the uh, Sub-Saharan Africa actually, and MENA have some of the highest, uh, highest levels of wealth and income inequality. I agree that, um, there, there may be political um, kind of uh, obstacles to, uh, to increasing wealth and income taxes, uh, but, the, but, but, the, but the issue is certainly not one, I, I would say that it's only relevant for OECD countries. Now, the problem with some of the informal, um, uh, informal social protection, there was a reference to informal social protection. I don't know whether the, uh, you mean in terms of what families and communities do for each other, uh, in terms of providing social protection. Um, the issue is this is part of the coping strategies that often uh, you know, come into existence when there isn't uh, a, a sort of a formal uh, system that is anchored in legislation that, that, has, uh, that provides benefits uh, and has very clear entitlements that sometimes households and communities do resort to these measures. But the problem is um, very often these are uh, very difficult to sustain. Uh, the issues of exclusion are particularly uh, uh, concerning uh, in terms of exclusion of, of certain ethnic groups, of certain of, of women in particular. Um, so, so I think um, the experience from many of those experiences of having small scale insurance level mechanisms has been uh, its limited reach and, um, and its lack of sustainability and the difficulty of really having any kind of redistribution because of the very small risk pools that they represent. Uh, I mean, the idea of having a broad social insurance system precisely is to widen the risk pool uh, so that uh, there is uh, much greater uh, risk sharing uh, if feasible. Um, I don't know on the question of the politics of it. Um, I think Maybe what, uh, what we can say is that I think the, the, if we can, if there can be uh, politically, um, uh, I mean, I think if there can be uh, strong arguments to show, and there are arguments to show that if you don't invest in social protection system, in public services, you know, you have some of the inequalities and some of the, um, some of the very harmful, um, uh, you know, forms of violence, uh, of crime, of, of a lot of the social ills that I think affects everyone. Uh, some of these issues, I think, will be useful in terms of really uh, driving the message home that having a, a protection system, a social protection system that is inclusive, that can reduce inequalities and can be, um, and can and can really give people a sense of social cohesion. Uh, this will also be a useful way for those who are better off to live in a society that is more peaceful and um, uh, and, uh, and and even for them, um, you know, easier 
to live with and, and, and providing more opportunities for their own children and, and for their future. Uh, because at the rate at which we're going with the rising inequalities, with the, uh, the kind of political and social divisions and risks that this is raising, this is also like becoming, um, I think, quite dangerous uh, for many countries in terms of the politics that it can also give rise to. And I think there is growing awareness uh, in many countries about, about this kind of uh, shared, uh, shared prosperity that we need to have. And I think some of the reports that are coming out of the World Bank, out of the IMF do kind of, I think, tap into this um, sensibility about the fact that after all, we do all live in, uh, in, a, in the same society and having some sense of social cohesion is absolutely key. Um, uh, so I think, I think there is a change. I think there is growing awareness of that. Thank you. I also see two hands. So let's go back to Neil. Uh, and then after Neil, we'll ask uh, Tandu and Matthews to also ask a question. Uh, actually, there will be a third person, uh, Maxwell Paracora from the SATAC uh, Secretariat. Uh, so let's start in that order, Neil, Tandiwe, and then Maxwell. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks, uh, Dr. Azavi, for a great, a great input. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things or raise a couple of points. The one is that the ILO, the international understanding of the UBI, um, is uh, is of a comprehensive cradle to the grave um, uh, uh, income insurance or basic income. Whereas in South Africa, the debate currently is about a basic income for uh, those who are from 18, age 18 to 59, and doesn't intend to replace the old age pension, the child support grant and other grants. Uh, because adults age 18 to 59 have had no income support until the COVID grant was introduced in 2020. So, so that's a significant difference. And we must remember that our social insurance scheme, in particular, the unemployment insurance fund, only covers about 7% uh, of, the, of the unemployed. So the debate in South Africa really, regardless of whether we go for a universal or a means-tested system, the, the, the real question is how do we respond to the extreme income poverty and hunger in South Africa uh, without some form of basic income for adults who are otherwise unprotected. And, you know, the context obviously is levels of poverty of over, over 50%, unemployment at, at over 12 million, as well as the fact that we've got a small informal and peasant sector, and that the majority of historically dispossessed South Africans are sitting in economically depressed ghettos with very little uh, economic activity, not to mention the, the world record inequality in our country. So, you know, this is the context within which the debate about basic income is taking place in South Africa. And I think the crisis around the delivery of the, the means-tested COVID grant currently is shining a spotlight on whether we shouldn't rather adopt a more universal uh, for, uh, uh, scheme. But in the end, whatever scheme we adopt, we have to, 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 to address this crisis, which you rightly uh, say, you know, leads to a massive social dysfunction, uh, crime, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, your comments on that would be appreciated. Professor, Can I speak would you like to... Me to come in now or should we collect a few more points? Yeah, I think let's collect a few more in case there's uh, some similarities. So let's move on to Tandiwe Matthews. Hi there, Prof. Razavi. Thank you so much for your presentation. My question relates more to um, the financialization of the grant system and the implications of reducing our constitutional right to social assistance, which is enshrined in our constitution, to becoming a social grant. Um, one of the challenges that I think we have in South Africa is that the dominant um, approach to social assistance, as we heard now with the Universal Basic Income Grant, for example, is this emphasis on grant income as reducing income inequality, which, as you mentioned in your presentation, doesn't address the multifaceted nature of systemic inequality along the lines of race, gender, class, and age. Um, we've seen that in terms of our expenditure on social protection, um, that hasn't increased in real terms over the last 25 years. 
And yet at the same time, our state can argue that it has fulfilled various requirements of the progressive realization of the right to social assistance at an international um, level. We can demonstrate an increase in the number of beneficiaries. We can demonstrate that we, in, we spend more um, than many African countries on our budget when it comes to social protection itself. So to try and then rely on the right as a means to compel the state to spend more becomes a bit problematic in legal terms. I just wanted to hear your views on, on alternative approaches that move away from just income inequality and a repeat of the kind of the old, <laughs> which we haven't seen having an impact, a real impact on transforming society in the way that social protection claims to um, reform society um, and what we can think of doing differently um, in this new context of, of increased global inequality. Thank you. Thank you, Tandwe. Can we just take one last question for this round from Maxwell? Maxwell? No, can you hear okay. me, Becky? Yeah, we can hear you now. Please go ahead. So thank you, Becky, uh, for inviting us to this uh, platform. This is uh, Maxwell Parakokwa from the SADC uh, Secretariat. So SADC is one of the RECs uh, of the African Union on the uh, uh, southern side. Uh, but I'm sure Razavi, you are well away. So thanks again, uh, Professor Shara for your presentation. I think it was on point. I was uh, interested in the slide where you talked about the leaky basket. And I, I think uh, it's spot on uh, because if I look at the history of our rec here at SADIC, it, it kind of summarizes exactly how we are attempting to do things, uh, focusing on trade relations, focusing on things like industry. And then clearly the assumption was that as we make progress in these areas, then the social benefits will trickle down. But you are right also that there is a realization that that will not work. And the good news, which I would like to share is that um, as, as SADIC is charting the way forward with what we call the SADIC Vision 2015. And in that Vision 2050, adopted in 2020, just recently, it, it, it marks a kind of a paradigm shift because this vision, which I'll read out, reads as follows. The vision is of a peaceful, inclusive, uh, competitive, middle to high income industrialized region where all citizens enjoy sustainable economic well-being, justice, and freedom. So that, that aspect of inclusion and that aspect of focusing on all citizens is certainly coming into play. And uh, to push some of the areas, especially around social protection in line with this vision, we are uh, targeting to develop a static social protection action plan uh, from next year. And this is uh, more or less to revise what we have as the SADIC code on social security of 2007 which is a bit outdated. So my, my question to you, uh, over and above sharing this experience and this change in approach, is to say, I know our new Director General, uh, Mr. Hongbo, is having this renewed emphasis on social protection. I think just yesterday I was talking of social protection and minimum wages is very important as we go forward. So I would like to know, uh, in line with this kind of a new vision or approach, what can we expect as Africa and as a regional economic community, uh, this side of the world, in this new kind of paradigm shift as well within the ILO with the new DG? What is it that we can expect as we go forward, uh, working with yourselves as ILO? Thank you. Dr. Razavi, can we take those? Uh three, and then there's another round of questions that have just come up. 
So if we could address those three, then we'll come back to the audience again. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try and maybe um, sort of go in reverse order and first try and respond to the colleague uh, uh, from SADC. Um, uh, you, have a, you have a very interesting question about the priorities of our new director general who has been in office now um, close to a week and a half. And uh, I, one thing that we know from uh, his vision statement and also from um, his uh, in the statements he has made since he has been uh, in the position of the director general has been the fact that I think social protection is very close to his heart. I think he sees it as uh, a very important part of what ILO does um, in tandem with the work on employment, on labor protection, uh, so I think for him, it's a, it's a big priority, um, something that uh, hopefully we were, going, we were going to see the ILO continue to take uh, the lead uh, in, the, in the UN system uh, in terms of providing technical support to countries and also in terms of really building uh, kind of coalitions, uh, at least at the global level where, you know, um, uh, the ILO operates with others, uh, not only other UN agencies, but also really trying to have a closer relationship also with some of the international financial institutions. Uh, you know, that, that, you know, particularly I'm thinking of the development banks of the World Bank who invest a lot of resources in social protection, but there is often a, a disconnect between what ILO standards and norms uh, or human rights, you know, social security standards say about the way in which systems need to be built um, and then uh, what happens uh, on the ground. So I think our director general would like to see a greater um, engagement between uh, the different institutions, you know, at the global level, so that, you know, not, not, not so much that, you know, this global conversation is important, it is important, but also because to make sure that when, uh, when, country, when UN agencies uh, have that technical presence on the ground, uh, together with others, with other development banks, that we do, um, you know, give advice that is consistent, a technical advice that is consistent to countries, rather than sort of singing from different songbooks and creating um, kind of confusion, uh, you know, among our interlocutors at the national level. And I think bringing the system together and, and, and really having a policy advice on building social protection systems that is based on the kind of conventions and recommendations that ILO has on social protection, which are some of the most detailed, you know, in terms of the uh, human rights uh, conventions, uh, I think would be a very good thing. We have been doing over the past uh, 10 years, uh, a lot of work that all of our colleagues have been doing in terms of bringing the UN system, at least so that, you know, we together with, you know, UNICEF and FAO and others that, that we really do share uh, a similar approach, um, a similar set of principles, so that in our interactions with our constituents at the national level, you know, we are giving advice that is consistent. Uh, but I think that challenge still remains to, you know, close that gap between what the UN as a system is advocating in terms of social protection and what the international financial institutions and multilateral development banks are doing. I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a divide that can be, you know, easily closed. It requires a lot of engagement, a lot of looking at real empirical evidence and looking at country experiences that have done well and really uh, trying to um, ensure that um, the best of what the international community has to offer is made available to our national constituents. So I think, I mean, I cannot speak for the director general, but I believe this is an important part of his vision of really trying to bring, uh, you know, the multilateral system together in a way that provides uh, useful and consistent um, technical support to uh, national governments uh, and constituents, other constituents, workers and employers organizations. On the issue of um, uh, the, the grants uh, and, and, and how to really be able to make a difference, you know, in South Africa, I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't very clear exactly about the, the question, but what I would say is that you know, the, 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 the South African grants, the grant system, the social assistance schemes, you know, they, they are quite, um, you know, extensive um, uh, in, in, in compared to many other, many other countries, at least in the region, but also beyond the region. 
but probably what uh, what there, but, but there have been some significant gaps and I'm really grateful to Neil um, Coleman for clarifying uh, that the discussion of, about UBI in South in South Africa is not about having a basic income you know for everyone replacing all the you know the child support grant and the pension and other things that are in place but really addressing the needs of that working age population which the grant system did not cover prior to COVID. So I think that's a really important step forward to make sure that there is uh, coverage for the risks for the working age population, working age uh, uh, people. And, um, and so in that sense, you know, if, if that COVID grant that was made available can become uh, something which is a more permanent feature with adequate levels of benefit, I think that would be a real big gain. So maybe, I mean, this idea of universal basic income shouldn't be used because in the global parlance, you know, a UBI means the same benefit often for everyone, you know, including children, older persons. Um, so, 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 so maybe that needs to be sort of, you know, clarified a bit more. And it's important to close that gap, particularly, as you said, given the very high levels of structural unemployment that South Africa has. Uh, we know this is uh, an entrenched problem, one that is not going away, and that many, I mean, this is a figure that you had of 7% of those who are unemployed actually being able to access the unemployment insurance fund. That really, I think, speaks to the importance of having um, a non-contributory uh, sort of um, scheme in place that can address the needs of those of those uh, women and men. So, um, so, so it'd be very interesting to see how uh, policy developments proceed in the South African context. But also to really be thinking at the same time, and I don't know um, what the state of debate is, about how to extend the coverage of the social insurance system. I think that would also be a really important part of the, of the equation in terms of the vertical dimension that I mentioned. So uh, thank you. Hey, thank you very much for those uh, responses, Dr. Razabi. I see that we have three questions that um, I would want to give the opportunity to verbalize them. So if we can give uh, Oko uh, the mic. Uh, Oko had a question that he typed, but I, I, I want to make sure that we give them the same opportunity. So if we can go in that order, Oko, Manasi, and Amara. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Great presentation. Um, uh, it's really quite interesting for me because I'm 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 a doctoral student um, at the University of Pretoria and I'm working on social protection. Um, what I was just wondering is how um, social protection systems in sub-Saharan Africa can be made um, more rights-based. Uh, South Africa is uh, is one good example. In, uh, in a lot of, uh, even outside, even be beyond Africa. So, but most social protection systems in the sub-Saharan African uh, sub-region are not rights-based. And so it it it's more of a government magnanimity. So people cannot take the government to court. Um, then that is why we see it's, um, it's, it's, it's the, the benefits are small. The, 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 the system of selection, the targeting system is weak. It, it, there's endemic corruption. If you go to country, a country like Nigeria, where the resources are there, the, the number of people covered is, is so, so low. And so I'm looking at the system, um, how do we design ways of making it right-based so that people can hold governments accountable? Thank you. Can we move on to uh, the next person, uh, Manasi? Manasi? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please go for it. Yeah, yeah. thank you for your presentation, uh, Shara. So my uh, question is related to different types of social protection schemes that you have also uh, discussed in your presentation. One important uh, type being how maybe care services can be provided, which can allow uh, women to work in market uh, based employment. So um, I come from India, and uh, uh, if we look at the uh, you know um, 
uh, situation in the developing countries, including uh, India. So here, even in the formal sector, the availability of care services is very, uh, you know, uh, rare. And even if the employees are demanding for these services, uh, it's not clear whether the state uh, should provide or the or the employer should provide and there is no as such laws which provide for make it mandatory uh, uh, for these services and which has been an issue and we can if it is not available in the formal sector I mean even the condition of informal sector would be even worse so um, I mean uh, how how uh, you know take it, um, this can be one example how the priorities in terms of what kind of uh, social protection services should be provided how can uh, maybe ILO or others can play a role in terms of uh, you know bringing that to attention of the policymakers where it has been discussed has been discussed for a long time that why this is important but it is not being taken up uh, seriously in the policy sector yeah that's what my question is thank you so much. Thank you. Can we uh, ask Amara and then um, Nico, can you prepare to be the last person to ask the question because you are running out of time and I would want us to finish on time. So Amara and then Nico. Um, hi, Dr. Razavi. Thank you so much for the interesting presentation. Uh, the initial question I had was about the role that the ILO has or should have um, in terms of agitating for greater social protection across the continent. I think you have kind of answered that already. So if, if you feel like you've addressed that issue sufficiently, um, a secondary question would be that um, in the context of South Africa, the lobby against a UBIG or UBIG type of um, social protection scheme is that we need to prioritize economic growth first and then sort of work on redistribution second, which is what you mentioned earlier on in your presentation. Um, and I think I'd just like some feedback on how you or the ILO um, has been able to deal with that type of misinformed sort of opinion that is really quite strong um, and comes a lot from the business lobby, which is, is quite vocal in, in South Africa. Thank you so much. Okay, Nico, you are the last one. Okay, um, let me see if I can retrieve Nico's question. Okay. Just a second, doctor, I want to retrieve Nico's question. Uh, before Nico, there was also another question from Louise. Uh, how can we ensure, how can we ensure that uh, expansion of social protection benefits particularly cash transfers does not come at the expense of public services and is not accompanied by increases in household indebtedness, considering inequality in its multidimensional form and not just income inequality. Too much of a focus on cash transfers would easily be accompanied by an increased commodification of life and greater overall inequality. Maybe we take those, uh, uh, doctor, because we are running out of time and then we can bring the lecture to a, con I mean, to a conclusion. Okay, very good. Um, so maybe I'll try and uh, sort of, I think it was, it's more of a comment, uh, the point that Oko had about, about rights-based social protection system. And I think we cannot emphasize that enough. Uh, uh, we put a lot of emphasis and I hope that at some point, uh, you know, some of your uh, audience will look at the World Social Protection Report of the ILO uh, that came out in September of 2021. That's the last issue of our World Social Protection Report. And you will see um, that we put quite a lot of emphasis in terms of the extent to which social protection um, schemes are kind of uh, anchored in legislation. And this is really an absolute um, uh, requirement in terms of having systems that have the kind of, it, it's, not a, it's not a given, but at least having systems that are you know, anchored in legislation does provide a much stronger ground for having greater accountability and transparency and entitlements that can be you know, actually claimed by beneficiaries um, and having uh, all the requirements of a system that is more responsive and more, uh, and more um, you know, um, 
uh, yeah, more right space. So I think that that fact is really important. And I, I agree with you that uh, the risk of having too many of these kind of schemes that are brought in, whether it's for political expediency or whether you know there is donor funding, which makes it available, it comes in, it has a short lifespan, it's not continued, there's no sustainability, and people cannot really rely on that system being there for when they need it, which is what a social protection system uh, has to do. So that, I think, point cannot be emphasized enough. How one gets there, I think, um, you know, it probably will require a lot of social struggle uh, and, and, and advocacy for making sure that the systems are, are right space um, and experience from countries uh, that shows that when you have that right space system, there's much more predictability for beneficiaries um, uh, and, and greater, as I said, transparency and responsiveness of the system to, to needs. So that I think has to be really, really emphasized. And unfortunately, you know, sometimes uh, the fact that in some countries there's too much emphasis on, on donor provided cash transfer programs that have a very short life and can be used for political expediency. I think that also, um, you know, creates, um, creates, uh, um, uh, 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 yeah, uh, does not, does not, does not provide the answers that we really need. Uh, I mean, sometimes you could have pilots that come in with donor funding, but the hope always is that once uh, the pilots work, that the government will take over, will provide the funding, and then also provide that as a, as a, as a, as a right and, and really have a right space system. Um, so I think that's an ongoing, an ongoing requirement, an ongoing struggle, and for social protection systems uh, across the world. The issue around uh, care services uh, that was raised, um, I mean, uh, if I had to give a short answer, I would say employer provided care services are probably not the best way to go. Um, the, uh, you do want you know, public services that are provided for childcare, let's say, and, um, and, and because also uh, this really increases labor market. Uh, so, so people can, can move jobs and not worry about losing you know, childcare facility that was provided by a particular employer. It's the same as, you know, employer financed, um, other, other uh, employer financed uh, social protection, employment liability system, employer financed liability system, as opposed to a socially, a social insurance system. So I, I see a parallel with the public services that you want them to be public services provided through uh, general revenue uh, rather than employer provided um, care services. So I think that would be the ideal scenario. Um, and in terms of um, uh, the last question uh, about how do we increase uh, the risks of having these social transfers that increase um, indebtedness. I mean, I think I know what, what the problem is that you're referring to about um, the commodification, but the, but, but, but the, I think, um, I mean, we need to really look at these cash transfers um, and what they're used for. And I think uh, the point is that for many of the beneficiaries who are getting these cash transfers, this is really um, very often just meeting the very basic needs. And I think I want to underline a fact that we know that we have at the moment, which is that you know, the wages are not keeping up and incomes of people are not keeping up with the, stand, with the, with the cost of living at the moment. We are in this very um, difficult context at the moment. And the latest count that we did of our social protection benefits in the world is that more than half of the social protection benefits don't have any form of indexation, uh, which is something which, if you do it according to the ILO standards, you know, social protection systems should be should have indexation so that they can keep up with the cost of living and there are different ways of doing the inter in indexation. But in a context where more than half of the benefits don't have that kind of indexation, what it means is that the real value and purchasing power of people is really shrinking, and and this is uh, this is a huge problem. And I would say that some of the transfers being very small and in the context of the cost of living crisis that we have are probably just being spent on very basic things like food and pay, uh, paying you know utility bills and so forth. Um, so I, I, let me let me leave it with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Razavi, uh, for joining us and joining the Southern Center uh, for Inequality Studies, the first university, and Conversation Africa in delivering this important lecture. 
Uh, and given the COVID context, the SDGs and the impending climate change crisis, new solutions are required in tackling inequality globally, but also in the Southern Africa region and in South Africa, as you have heard from the many questions and interest from the participants. I think you have really provided us with data, with insights, as well as policy options as we strive to make the best for our people through research policies and action. Thank you and for your colleagues for taking the time um, and those that worked with you in preparing this lecture. Of course, the lecture builds on previous ones that were given in 2019 by Ashwin Deshpande uh, and in 2020 by Ravi Kumba and in 2021 by Winnie Bianima. Uh, I also want to thank the colleagues at the center, uh, David Francis, Desili, Kizo, and many others who were involved in uh, putting together this lecture. Of course, I've just received uh, a text from Imran. He's sending his gratitude, his mid-air, uh, the beauty of technology these days. Uh, but I also want to thank uh, Professor Lynn Morris, our Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation. Um, and as we end this lecture, let me shine a spotlight on some of the center's uh, flagship projects. Uh, that you should look forward to in the coming months. So the first is that the center is uh, doing some work on the future of work, uh, the Future of Workers Research Group, which is an interdisciplinary transnational program, which explores how digital technologies are reshaping the world of work and its implications for inequality in the global South. The second is the public finance project. And as we speak, there's going to be uh, a report launch uh, tomorrow, which focuses on social goods, public employment, and the budget webinar. This takes place tomorrow, like I said, ahead of the finance minister tapping the medium term budget policy statement. Then, of course, there's a, a master's degree uh, in, in inequality studies, which is an interdisciplinary master's program that, that draws from economics, sociology, politics, and education to offer a unique approach to inequality studies. It offers a thorough and rigorous grounding in the literature, theory, and methods of inequality studies, as well as an in-depth exposure to current topics in inequality studies taught by those at the cutting edge of inequality research. With those words, let me thank you all, uh, the participants and delegates to this lecture. And once again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Razavi and your team. Uh, have a good evening, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you, everyone. Thank you and very much, Professor Moyo. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.